So yeah, my name is Alex Scarlatos. Um, I guess our my story kind of starts when I was about five years old. My family moved next door to the family of Spencer Stone, and we grew up together pretty much like it was almost like it was one house. I mean, both doors would be unlocked. We'd go raid each other's fridges, watch movies at each other's house. It was a great childhood. Uh, about 2010 or so, I moved up to Oregon with my father. But Spencer and I and Anthony, my, our other friend, we all kind of stayed in touch. And 2012, I joined the Army National Guard and Spencer joined the Air Force. Fast forward two more years and in 2014, I did a deployment to Afghanistan and Spencer was stationed in Portugal. So coming off of that deployment, I wanted to tour Europe because I had a little bit of money and burning a hole in my pocket. And Spencer was already in Europe and Portugal. So... A month after the deployment, I flew back. We uh, we all kind of toured Europe. We met up in Amsterdam, and a lot of things kind of put us in that time and place. We debated on staying in Amsterdam another day or two just because it was so much fun, but I'll skip over most of that. And then uh, we decided to stick with our original plan of going to Paris. We were about to board the train. We had first class tickets, but an elderly British gentleman uh, wanted our help, so we helped him get on the train. We kind of ended up in the middle of the train, which we were fine with. Then the Wi Fi went down, and um, being a millennial, Wi Fi is more important than bread or water. So <laughs> we moved up to first class where there was better Wi Fi, luckily. And uh, I even traded Spencer's seats because I wanted to be on the window seat because I like history and we were going through Belgium which had a lot of interesting World War One battlefields on it and things of that nature. So about two hours into the train ride we stopped in Brussels and they changed crew and whatnot and a couple, couple passengers came on board and about 15 minutes after that stop Spencer and Anthony were both asleep and I was texting people on my phone using the Wi-Fi and I heard a gunshot and breaking glass come from behind us. And so what had happened was at the Brussels stop, a terrorist came on board with an AK-47 and a backpack and all of the ammunition and a handgun. And he got everything ready in the bathroom and he had been in there for about 15 minutes. And when he came out, he had been in there so long that there were two passengers waiting to use the bathroom when he came out. One of them named Damien immediately realized what was going on and just started choking the terrorist by the neck and the AK-47 was kind of pinned between them. Another passenger, Mark McGallion, who was next to Damien, started trying to get the AK-47 from the terrorist. A train employee came up thinking it was a fight and kind of pulled them apart. Then he saw what was going on, ran to the front of the train. Mark McGallion finally got the AK-47 from him, started running to the front of the train. Damien ran to the back of the train. The terrorist then pulled out a handgun that he had had in his waistband and shot Mark McGallion in the neck. And he fell and dropped the AK-47, and that was the gunshot and breaking glass that I first heard. So I kind of put my head up, and I'm like, what's that sound? Then we see a train employee running away from the noise at a full sprint, which wakes Spencer and Anthony up. We all kind of turn around at the same time to see what he was running from, and there's a shirtless man with an AK-47. We immediately realize what's going on. Um, I mean, we were kind of paranoid. We had talked about what it, what would happen in a situation like that ahead of time. So we all knew we were on the same page. So we ducked down behind the seats. I hit Spencer on the shoulder and I'm like, go get him, basically. <laughs> um, he was on the aisle seat. I had no choice, okay? <laughs> Spencer runs up to him, tackles him. For whatever reason, isn't shot. Um, I follow him. By the time I, I get up to him, Spencer already has him in a chokehold over a seat. So I pick up the AK-47 and I try to shoot the terrorist with it. And I notice that it's on safety, so nothing's working. Um, then I, before I can even think of what else to do, I see the terrorist pull out the handgun and he's trying to line it up with Spencer's head. So I drop the AK-47, grab the handgun hit him like once or twice with the handgun then the terrorist then pulls out a box cutter and starts cutting Spencer in the back of the neck 
So then Spencer yells, he's got a knife, he kicks him off, and by that time Anthony comes up behind me, so the terrorist is kind of in between all three of us in the aisle. So we all just start kind of punching him, trying not to get cut by the knife. Finally, we kind of push him back into Spencer. Uh, Spencer and I kind of like push his head on the table, and so he's kind of like bent over with his head on a table. I put the handgun to his head and I say, stop resisting, stop resisting. I don't think he spoke English, so it didn't do much help. So I pulled the trigger and the handgun went click. And I go to cycle it to try to load another round in the chamber and I notice that it's empty. So I just go, you know, shit, and I throw the gun. Because <laughs> uh, what had happened was when he pulled the handgun out to shoot Mark in the neck, he had dropped the magazine out. So the only one that was, the only bullet in the gun was the one in the chamber. And so when he fired, it cycled like it was still loaded with the hammer cocked back. Um, so I throw the gun. Spencer then puts him in another chokehold across the opposite seat. I pick up the AK-47 and just start kind of hitting him in the head with it. Uh, finally, his arms kind of go limp and he goes unconscious from Spencer's chokehold. Spencer then throws him into the aisle. I hold his arms behind his back um, and we're looking for something to tie him up with. And then we notice that there's a man with blood squirting out of his neck, which was Mark who had been shot in the neck. Uh, from then on, it all kind of played like a movie. Um, we all just kind of fell into our own individual roles. Spencer was an EMT in the Air Force, so he stopped the bleeding in Mark's neck. I took the AK-47, uh, took it off safety. I went to load a round into the chamber and a round ejected, which meant that it was loaded when Spencer ran at him. And I see the bullet on the seat in front of me, and I notice there's a dent in the primer. So I pick it up and look at it. And there's a solid hit on the primer, and uh, basically that just means that the gun functioned fine. The terrorist pointed the gun at us and fired, but the weapon didn't go off. Just luckily he had bad ammunition. So I loaded another round into the chamber, checked the rest of the train to make sure there are no other injured people or any other terrorists, and uh, came back, helped Spencer with Mark McGallion, and... Uh, we handled the situation on our own for about 20, 25 minutes before we got to the train station. And from then on, I mean, we were just kind of taken in as heroes and whatnot, even though we were just doing what we had to do to survive. Um, but for me, the Second Amendment is a very important issue because without the Second Amendment, I would not have known how to use an AK-47 because the only reason I knew how to use one, I mean, I'd been in the Army for like three years at that point, and we'd never been taught how to use an AK-47, but luckily I had one at home personally. That was the only reason I knew how to use one. I concealed carry every day, and of course in Europe you can't conceal carry, and if I had my Glock 43 on me, it would have made the whole situation a hell of a lot easier because <laughs> he was just standing up in the middle of the aisle pretty much just asking to be shot, but nobody had a gun on them, of course. And the other thing is, of course, Europe is a gun-free continent, pretty much. I mean... This guy still got a fully automatic AK-47 and a 9 mil handgun. And you're telling me gun control is going to work in the United States? Yeah, I don't think so. So then, I, we go home. A lot of other things happen. But six weeks after the terrorist attack, I'm in Los Angeles. And I get a text from a reporter friend of mine saying there's a shooting at your college. So... That was the Umpqua Community College shooting of October 1st, 2015, if you remember that one back that far. Um, so I fly home because I'm, they hadn't released names of anybody that had been killed, and a lot of my friends from the National Guard that I deployed with were at that college. So I fly home, and finally the news comes out that there were nine people that were killed, and luckily none of them were friends of mine. But this guy got a lot of the guns from his mom, he was kind of known to be a little bit of a crazy person, so he didn't have a lot of friends, so he's kind of your stereotypical shooter. But the other thing that made me mad was I carried a gun every day when I went to UCC, and a lot of people did not because it was against the college's rules. Even though in the state of Oregon it's legal to carry on college campuses, the college made a rule against it, so most people just assumed that it was illegal. So most people, even my friends who I deployed with, did not have guns on them that day. And in that classroom, nobody did have a gun. And as a result, nine people were killed. I was there for about maybe four or five days, and I was going to fly back down to Los Angeles. 
and I get a call from Spencer, Spencer's older brother, and he calls me and he says, hey, don't freak out, but Spencer's in the hospital. He got stabbed in a bar fight and he might die. So then I fly from my hometown that just had a shooting to Sacramento, California to be with Spencer. What had happened was he was at a bar with some friends. Um, one of the females that he was with drank too much and was throwing up on the sidewalk outside of the bar. Uh, a couple Asian guys started filming her and making fun of her. And so one of her friends then told them basically to go to hell and get out of here. So then one of the guys punched her in the face. So then, of course, Spencer had to intervene. And so he started fighting these guys. And the surveillance video is actually on YouTube. And it's actually pretty amazing because he's fighting a five on one fight and winning. <laughs> and so he's beating them bad enough to where they finally pull knives to win and they stab him in the heart, lung and the liver. And it was so bad that, I mean, they thought he was going to die. So homicide was called because there was going to be a murder of an investigation, but somehow he ends up surviving. Uh, and the weird thing about that event was they use knives, not guns, but yet Spencer living in California could not have a gun on him to defend himself. I mean, just like you see in the UK and all over Europe. I mean, if they don't have guns, they'll use knives, they'll use bombs, they'll use trucks. It, violence, it, violence does not matter. I mean, it'll find a way. The other part is my little brother offered Spencer a gun. He said, oh, you're going to the bars downtown here. Take my Glock. Spencer said, no, that's illegal in California. I'm okay. And as a result, he almost paid with his life. So to me, the Second Amendment is not just about you know, hunting. <laughs> it's about the right to defend yourself, the right to overthrow a tyrannical government. And just in my life, in a that was only a seven-week period, I had three events in my life that all could have been stopped with a gun. And I mean, in some cases, we got lucky and nobody died. But in other cases, I mean, like UCC, nine people died because nobody had a gun in that room. So anyway, that's my speech. If you have any questions, please feel free if I have time.